Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian at Naval Air Station Whidbey Island, where we are talking to the man who commands all of the Pacific Fleet's electronic attack aircraft, Captain Scott Farr. Sir, thanks very much for uh, hosting us. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, one of the important things is um, electronic warfare is uh, an airborne electronic attack are both important uh, parts, whether you're discussing in the third offset context, uh, you look at some of the things that the Russians have been doing, some of the things that the Chinese are working on theoretically, but also in a real world basis. What are the important capabilities that your aircraft, your 14 squadrons bring to the force? Well, uh, we are the, Navy, the DOD's sole provider of tactical airborne electronic attack. So uh, we support every at airborne asset in the joint force from uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines in any, uh, in any environment. And right now, how many aircraft do you have under your command? Uh, we have 14 squadrons of five jets each. And they are distributed, um, give us the geographic distribution of your forces. All, uh, all E-18Gs are home-based here out of Whidbey Island, Washington. We do have one squadron that is permanently forward deployed at Naval Air Facility Atsugi, Japan, attached to Carrier Wing 5. The um, Russians have been demonstrating capability in Ukraine. Uh, Chinese are also working on, on capabilities uh, that the United States looks as worrying in, the, in this field. As a professional in this business, what are some of the capabilities that these potential adversaries are developing that are forcing you to think through how differently you may operate in the future? Uh, well, the pr proliferation of long-range surface-to-air missile systems, as well as the fielding of new fifth-generation uh, adversary platforms, uh, everything is becoming more and more spectrum dependent. So the more we influence the spectrum in our favor and have the ability to maneuver within the spectrum, that will assure our capability to be within the adversary's decision cycle. Uh, the Navy has started electromagnetic maneuver warfare. Uh, we are a critical piece of that plan. Um, back in the EA-6B, we used to focus on one mission, and that was defined as a suppression of enemy air defenses. While we still execute that mission, we've kind of redefined that into disruption of the adversary's kill chain, as well as enhancing the blue kill chain. So everything that we can do to prevent the adversary from getting a shot before our forces can get a shot buys us that critical advantage. When you are looking at any access area denial, which I know that the Navy that the Navy has moved beyond that that phrase uh, at the direction of the Chief of Naval Operations, but that still remains one of the very big challenges that we have. As you're looking, how do you operate at doing what you do in an area which is any access area denied? Obviously, a lot of Chinese capabilities are designed to push the United States as far away from its shores, whether with DF-21 or DF-26 with the kinetic side of things. And then there's also the expectation that the communications nodes and networks that we depend on uh, to be the world's best military will be degraded and disrupted. How do you operate in this degraded environment? Uh, and how do broader operations take place when people may not be able to communicate the way that they've been accustomed to? Well, that's a great question. Certainly over the last 15 years, we have become very, very spectrum dependent. Uh, you know, the ability to see operations as they go down, uh, for example, the photo of the Situation Room where elected authorities are watching the Navy SEALs' actions on the objective during the bin Laden raid, uh, that is all very spectrum dependent. Uh, in this day and age, we're really looking at our lessons from the past. The current commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, Admiral Scott Swift, uh, has given guidance that we want to focus on mission command. And uh, it's really nothing new to the Navy it's, and Marine Corps team. We're going back to our roots where we have centralized planning, decentralized execution. And in the event that we are operating independently and not attached, we have those mission orders that enable the commander that is on scene to act decisively and aggressively and uh, make the uh, moves that need to be made in that scenario. Electromagnetic maneuver warfare, as I mentioned earlier, plays a critical role in that. The ability to manage your signature within the spectrum in order to deny the enemy shot, uh, no matter what platform you're speaking of, whether it's an aircraft carrier or a surface combatant or an airplane, uh, is critical to that capability and ensure the, secure, the uh, survivability of our force 
uh, while maintaining the correct posture to go on the offensive. Um, your joint capability, it was created in the uh, uh, early 1990s when the Air Force got out of the business. Uh, the whole um, EF-111s were, were retired. Uh, and then the Air Force, uh, Marine, as well as the Navy folks all coalesced around the EA-6B uh, aircraft. Talk to us still about the Air Force presence that exists here that's a component of what you guys are doing in terms of delivering capability. Certainly. And we have uh, currently four expeditionary E-18G squadrons that uh, support the joint force. In those squadrons, we have Air Force aviators who are uh, highly qualified, and it's a pleasure to be working with them. They come in and fly with us for a tour and then take that talent back to the uh, Air Force and integrate into their uh, platforms back with the Air Force. Uh, when you look at the JSF coming online, the mission overlap between JSF and E-18G is significant. The JSF has significant electronic warfare capabilities. So uh, aviators with E-18G experience are going to pay dividends for the uh, United States Air Force as they field the uh, JSF. When, you know, you mentioned the joint capability and the different pieces of, of it that are all going into the whole um, spectrum warfare pie, if you will. Um, you know, Navy's bringing the, the, the G model um, if you look at it, the Marine Corps has been working up the intrepid tiger tree in terms of distributing the electronic warfare assets. Uh, if you talk to Dog Davis, he's very eager to talk about unmanned systems in the world they're playing. How is this electromagnetic electronic attack universe going to look like, say, 10 years from now, when you have a much more distributed set of uh, air, air assets, which are manned, unmanned, uh, some of them may be on things as different as a C-130 or, or a helicopter, as well as a Harrier and a JSF and a, and a Growler. And then if you look at it, you know, the, the surface force is working on uh, better electronic warfare systems, as well as the Air Force. What is this picture going to look like, say, in, in, a, in a decade, say? Absolutely, and you hit the nail on the head, and that's the essence of electromagnetic maneuver warfare. We tend to be pretty parochial in uh, in the Navy and Marine Corps and, well, any service, and you, you look at your tribe based on the platform which you fly. Now we have to move away from that and look at the capabilities that we have across platform and how those are integrated and synchronized to bring both kinetic and non-kinetic fires to effect in the, uh, in the operational environment. So manned unmanned teaming is gonna play a significant role 10 years down the road. There are capabilities across all platforms now that we have to ensure that we synchronize so that we have the knowledge of the electromagnetic environment and both Blue Force, our own signature, as well as the adversary signature. You know, as uh, on, in the commercial sector, as everything becomes more and more wireless, the electromagnetic spectrum becomes more and more congested. And when you get into conflict, it is both congested and contested. Our aviators and operators, electronic warfare operators out there, are not looking to get a needle in a haystack and select out a uh, potential target. They're having to select a needle out of a pile of needles. So this gets to the manpower that is required to effectively execute the electronic warfare mission is so very, very critical. Uh, people look at it as a technical nature and, you know, it's not something you just go through a switch on. You have to have manpower and expertise that knows every bit of the kill chain from the find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess in the electronic warfare mission to get that effect that you need. How do you guys um, counter sometimes the criticism that's delivered that a lot of the assets we have now are too short range, that if you look at what the Chinese particularly are trying to do is to push the United States uh, and its allied forces as far away from the coasts as its shores as possible, hold at risk its land bases as well, hold at risk aircraft carriers. Uh, and when folks look at, say, even the Joint Strike Fighter, but then the F-18 say, wow, you know, that's a very short ranged aircraft to get close close to the shore to be able to to, to project power. How do you counter that as the, as the man who's in charge of all of these assets? Well, I would say that uh, range is a relative thing. Uh, if you are able to create a sanctuary within that area of risk where your force can operate at the acceptable level of risk, then you can push your assets where they need to influence the targets that need to be uh, influenced. Uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, electronic warfare in the third offset is there to ensure mission success. You know, back in, uh, we, we were victims of our, our own success somewhat in Desert Storm in that 
blue losses were so very, very low, and we've gotten very accustomed to that. As we get into a more contested environment, we have to look at, first and foremost, mission success. And that third offset investment assures our second offset investments in precision weapons that will generate that mission effectiveness. When you look at um, how you guys are going to have to operate in the future, everybody, you know, you, you mentioned centralized planning, but, but decentralized execution. And the decentralization is going to be even more profound. Generally, um, aircraft of this sophistication tend to operate from certain set bases as opposed to scattering over a wide uh, geographic area. And there's no wider geographic area than in, than in the Pacific. What's your thinking in terms of how best uh, to penny packet these aircraft in a vast, uh, you know, w- one from the standpoint of sort of augmenting, uh, you know, the safety where you're not concentrating the aircraft in one place, but also being able to operate from as distributed a manner as possible, because the capabilities you bring to bear are not only as important for the Navy and the Air Force, but also for the Army, who's going to be on the ground in a lot of these places. Absolutely. And we are focusing, again, uh, Admiral Swift has challenged us to take a look at all of our logistics and uh, how we are doing business and how we can operate in a contested environment where we may not have that reach back and be able to operate uh, uh, independently for a certain amount of time where we don't have to phone home for whatever supplies we may need and focusing on looking at bases where there's not developed DOD infrastructure, traditional bases like Iwakuni, Japan, Osan in South Korea and uh, other areas, but going forward and operating uh, in, say, uh, land bases around the South China Sea. Uh, We have done that in the expeditionary mission. We've operated in Eastern Europe. Uh, in the expeditionary mission as well during exercises. So uh, we've had a good exposure and a a good learning curve in that arena and are moving forward to enable those uh, independent, very austere operations. Do you, um, does that change how the training that your sailors need? Because one of the things that the force did was um, divest some of those organic capabilities, looked for contractors to do that mission. and And there are those now who say these skills need to be you know, in the force among sailors, because you may not be able to get contractors to where you need them potentially in a future conflict. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, you know, the Navy focuses pretty on uh, independent operations. Uh, There's no more independent operations than those from a uh, aircraft carrier. So task organization wise, uh, our expeditionary squadron are a little bit larger than the uh, ones on the aircraft carrier because you don't have the economy of scale that you do on the carrier where you can cross pollinate with say F-18 ENF squadrons on some skill sets. Uh, but we have, uh, we have very good manning to manage uh, all the uh, missions that we need. You know, we've been operating out of Bagram, Afghanistan uh, and other uh, kind of austere bases uh, I deployed in there first for in uh, 2004, uh, and we've done done so with success throughout the global war on terror. Um, you mentioned uh, Bagram. Obviously, the EA-6B was a key capability uh, there. The Growler, its successor, is also a, a key capability. Um, do you have... Um, and, and obviously, the, the G is, is, is produced by, by Boeing. Uh, full disclosure, Boeing is, is one of our sponsors. But um, do you have enough of the jets, ultimately? And how many more of those aircraft do you need to, met, to meet your global obligations? Uh, well, currently, uh, the Congress has uh, purchased 160 of the uh, E-18Gs. Uh, our original program of record was 86. So we have in- effectively doubled the uh, number of aircraft that we were originally going to be apportioned. Uh, What is the end state? I would say that uh, that remains to be seen as we develop the mission. And, uh, you know, those are those are questions that are going to be answered well above my pay grade. (laughs) And uh, there are a lot of factors that go into that equation. But right now we are focused on employing that the force that we have and also extending the life of that force for as long as we possibly can. Um, And how many of the aircraft are now um, on the ramps or decks? Uh, there have been 122 of the E-18Gs uh, built out of the 160, so we are two-thirds of the way through the build. Uh, but we've current squadron construct is uh, five jets each. And what's the burn rate on those airplanes? Is it running higher than you had anticipated originally or the Navy had anticipated? 
Uh, well, deployed operations, uh, especially in U.S. Central Command, uh, they are a high demand asset. So uh, we have to take a look at how we are operating them uh, for the long game and program and move those aircraft around to ensure that uh, we have equitable utilization across the force. Let me take you, we are standing not by coincidence near uh, an Australian flag. I was pointing at that. Well, that's yes, part of it. That's yeah, that's Royal right Australian there. It's the U.S. Air Force. Force. You have Navy. Yes. You have Royal Australian Air Force. You have an Australian flag over there. Yes. Um, well, you know, obviously, Australia is one of the countries, you know, the United States has always had this capability, but Australia, this is a new capability that Australia is is getting. From a partnership capacity, how's that training program going? Um, how are they adjusting to the weather? Because it's really tropical up here in the Pacific Northwest, especially as we meet here. Uh, I, I didn't bring my board shorts, but, uh, you know, how, how is that whole process going for, for the Aussies as they get uh, and, uh, up to speed on the airplane? Well, I'll tell you, uh, it has been absolutely fantastic. They have sent us the cream of the crop of the Royal Australian Air Force. We have six aviators who have been embedded in our, squ our expeditionary squadrons for the last two years. Uh, on Wednesday, we just patched the first crop of FRS fleet replacement squadron graduates, and number six squadron has stood up as a airborne electronic attack platform. When you look at the uh, construct of the Royal Australian Air Force, it very much mirrors how the United States Navy is uh, constructed in that they have fourth and fifth generation mix. They also have MH-60 Romeo and P-8 that have a robust electronic warfare capability. So uh, they have come to Whidbey Island and uh, joined the family at the home of electronic attack and integrated flawlessly. You know, I'm going to be sad to see them go. They are a fantastic uh, group of professionals and their families are absolutely awesome. Um, do you, what, what's it like um, operating, what are the challenges, um, you know, obviously partnership is a key thing, United States Navy, Air Force, all the military services work on partnerships with their uh, sister services in a variety of different allied countries, whether in the Pacific or anywhere in the world, but this capability is very much of a unique capability for the U.S. military that historically has, has dominated it, focused on it, and not our allies have not been as sophisticated nor have that degree of capacity. When you're working on joint exercises, joint training, uh, and even on an engagement level, what are some of the challenges um, of, of, of being able to partner if potentially some of the countries are not as familiar with the capability nor how to, to, to use it as, as we are? Well, you know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I'll tell you, with the Australians, uh, they have been our closest ally and fought alongside us in every conflict since World War I. So integrating with them has been uh, absolutely flawless. Our objective when operating with uh, the Australians has been that there is no difference in capability between an Australian E-18G and an American E-18G. It doesn't matter uh, if... Uh, you show up on station and you're being supported by one E18G or another, you know. You may have one uh, with a funny accent on the radio, but that's probably because the pilots from, or the EWOs from Alabama, not because they're <laughs> from Australia. Um, but I was saying for the countries that may not have that capability, right? I mean, not, not all of the countries, um, you know, that are in the Pacific have this kind of capability. Okay. How, do you, how do you bridge that divide between what you're bringing to the party, what they're bringing to the party, to get them to understand what you can contribute in, in the case of a future uh, engagement? Well, we exercise that routinely in our uh, partner engagements uh, across the Pacific. Uh, you know, we uh, deploy forward to Misawa Air Base in Japan and routinely do exercises uh, in South Korea and in Guam with our partner nations over there and uh, are actively practicing that integration. We do the integration process during mission planning and execute it while we are airborne. And so uh, they can understand our capabilities and limitations and how, uh, how we can uh, best benefit and increase their mission effectiveness and survivability in a contested environment. Um, I want to take you now to uh, two, two questions because I know your time is brief with us. Um, first is, uh, you were an EA-6B guy. Yes. Uh, you're now a, a growler, uh, uber man on the, on the, on the growler uh, force, but uh, or the, the head of that. 
what are the capabilities differences between the two airplanes? What did the Prowler do well? What does the Growler do better? What, what's, what's the difference between these two uh, generationally different aircraft that share some common systems in the ALQ-99? Uh, and, you know, one was a four-man airplane, the other a four-person airplane, and the other one's a two-person airplane. You know, what, are, what were the differences in these, in, these, in these two jets? Well, I would say first and foremost is uh, the connectivity that you have with the E-18G, as well as the ability to safely operate and survive in a contested environment, both surface-to-air and air-to-air uh, domain. The uh, high-performance high uh, airframe, uh, the very, very complex sensors, you know, we, we have ICAP-3 EA-6Bs, which have the ALQ-218 receiver system, uh, and they have the connectivity, but it's still uh, kind of like driving a 57 Chevy versus a uh, 2016 Corvette. Th everything is different. The performance handling characteristics are different. Uh, it is going to, it's gonna be more maintainable. Uh, it's gonna have a higher sortie rate because you don't have all the uh, maintenance challenges that you did. It's gonna have lower cost per flight hour, so it's much more efficient. Uh, I'll tell you the human machine interface between the E18G and the, uh, and the uh, EA6B is kind of the difference between Xbox and playing Atari Pong, which you and I are probably a little more familiar with. Yeah, that was, that was about as sophisticated as a game as I could play. It was just easy and didn't have as many buttons. Um, the, um, uh, a, a, a rapid learning question. I noticed that you've got some great books on your bookshelf. Yes. Uh, we were talking about a couple of couple of those chief of naval operations as Admiral John Richardson has made uh, rapid learning, innovation, sort of watchwords of his of his of his tenure. What does that mean to you as somebody who's on the pointy end of the spear? Well, it's taking what we have and making it better, leveraging everything that uh, is at our disposal. Uh, you know, our greatest asymmetric advantage is our people and the ideas that they have and the ability to implement those ideas outside of, you know, statutory acquisition cycles and things, you know, we do things uh, in a very waterfall manner, but to do it in a very rapid fashion to get capability uh, to the fleet or innovate and make a new tactic technique or procedure uh, at zero to no cost uh, that will give us that advantage uh, it's it's what's it's the game changer so investing in that uh, that uh, young person who's got a great idea and uh, fostering that and tell them hey it may not have worked this time but let's work out the bugs take those calculated risks and uh, lean forward in the straps. Don't be afraid to trip uh, every now and then. And let me take you to the last question, which is uh, noise. Uh, I know that that's something that's on your mind with the local community. The base here next year is going to celebrate its 75th anniversary. Uh, key to the economy in the region, 7, 000, more than 7,000 people that are at this installation, if you include the P-8s as, as well as the rescue and, and, then, and then you guys. But this is a jet, the F-18 is a, is a jet that is, uh, the E-18, I should say, but F-18, you know, is a jet that is a little more, a little louder uh, than the aircraft that it replaced. There are some concerns. How are you working with the local community to address some of those concerns, whether it's about noise or, or anything else? Well, this is, this is one of those areas that uh, it's very, very important to stay engaged. Uh, point in fact is that the uh, E-18G is actually not as loud as the EA-6B. It operates its uh, different frequency band, but it's not as loud as the uh, EA-6B. Let me, let me re-ask that question yeah. so it doesn't sound as misleading as that, because okay. you're absolutely right. That's what they're saying, or that there are complaints about noise. How are you working with them? Let me change the nature of that the question a little bit, because I don't want to contribute to supporting what their case is, because I understand what your case is. Let me take you to the final question, which is uh, about noise. This base has been in this area. Uh, next year is your 75th anniversary. Uh, more than 7,000 people, if you include the uh, patrol aircraft, you include the, uh, the electronic attack aircraft, and obviously the, the small contribution, but nonetheless important from, from your search and rescue uh, unit. Um, one of the things that there are complaints from the local community about noise, uh, the allegation that the F-18 is louder than the A-6B that, that replaced it, um, that's something, obviously, you know, the, the Navy always prides itself to have a good relationship with its neighbors, and this is no different. How are you working with the local community and addressing uh, at least that question as well as those concerns? 
Certainly. Well, first and foremost, we are following uh, the law that is environmental law that is written. Uh, we are uh, following the environmental impact statements that are written into uh, NEPA law and going through that process. Currently, we are going into the local area in the community, setting up uh, engagements, and we are getting very good dialogue with the, uh, with the local population, presenting the facts of our operations around here, trying to wipe the fog off the mirror as to why people may hear things you know, one night, but then they don't hear it the next night. Why is that? And well, because of how we have to operate in federal aviation airspace is a primary driver there. But we all want to be good, hus good uh, custodians of the environment because we're all residents here too. Our families live here and we enjoy the outdoors. You know, it was, uh, it's actually the story of a, uh, a great environmental story in that folks didn't even know we were flying over the uh, Olympic Peninsula until we told them that we were looking to enhance our training over the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, we've been doing that for the last 42 years since, uh, well, correction, for the last uh, 48 years since the first airborne electronic attack platforms got up here from NAS Alameda in 1968. So it's, uh, you constantly have to stay engaged and you have to, you have to talk to people. Doesn't mean you always have to have a, an agreement, but having that civil discourse is critical and part and parcel of uh, what we do. But one of the other things is uh, that you had mentioned to me that actually, in point of fact, the F-18 is not louder than the, than the EA-6B. What do the facts say on that from your guys' standpoint? Well, the, uh, the sound modeling that was done by uh, the folks out that uh, take issue with our noise level uh, was valid validated the Navy's finding that the E-18G is actually quieter than the uh, EA-6B. And uh, they had filed a suit, and it went up to court, and the, the court, who is the third branch of government and the check on the executive branch under which we fall, found that, in fact, the uh, E-18G is quieter than the EA-6B. Sir, thanks very much for taking so much time to meet with us. Really enjoyed the conversation. Well, it's my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today.